joined by Dr. Ruth Murambadoro on the Blue Couch. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Ruth. How are you doing today? I'm well, thank you, Odell, for bringing me here. Ah, it's my pleasure. I'm, I'm so excited to be chatting to you today. I know that, you know, whatever insights you're going to share is going to be so valuable um, to our listeners. The first question I want to ask you is, um, you know, just basically like, you know, who is Ruth? Um, you know, you could perhaps tell us something more personal about yourself or just tell us about Ruth the academic. Okay, I, I think um, I'm comfortable telling you the two sides of me. I always feel that people connect more with the human being when they can understand, you know, their holistic um, uh, development as a person, where they come from and stuff like that. So I guess you could say, um, in terms of my stay here in South Africa, I'm an immigrant from Zimbabwe. That's where I was born and raised. Um, having been born in a rural area called Buhera, um, that's where I was born a couple of years back. Of course, they say a woman's <laughs> age is a secret, so <laughs> don't worry about that. Let's not go there. Uh, but yeah, that's that's where I was born. And um, I studied all my primary and secondary education in Zimbabwe and relocated to South Africa in 2008 uh, to pursue my Bachelor's of Political Science at the University of Pretoria. Honestly, I thought I'd just be there for my undergrad and I go yeah. back home and hopefully get a job. But I mean, reality uh, struck me when, you know, you pursuing your undergrad and you're seeing that the situation back home is not getting any better. And funny enough, I actually came to South Africa because I was not offered any placement in Zimbabwe. I applied to do my uh, tertiary education back home at the University of Zim, but I never got a response. So it was almost like, oh my goodness, do I just sit at home or what? Not that I didn't have good grades, but it gets all political in different uh, spaces and stuff like that. So uh, South Africa became an option because already my other siblings were here. Um, my sister was pursuing her postgraduate studies. My brother had already been here working. So it was almost like a joining family. So I would say that's how I've ended myself here in South Africa. And I stayed. Um, I stayed partly because, you know, you, you move uh, thinking that you are pursuing your, your studies to advance yourself. But when you find yourself not necessarily fitting in the market economy, and you have to keep on upgrading yourself, upgrading yourself, hoping that one day you would fit mm. in. So that's sort of like how I, I stayed on um, from my bachelor's on to my um, honors, my master's and PhD, which I all did at the University of Pretoria. Of course, we can talk more about that yeah. and why I stayed there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's actually the, the next question, you know, it's just about your um, sort of academic trajectory. So for for a lot of people, it's just about, you know, but what they study for you, it's obviously your trajectory as an academic as well. Um, so what did you study after your, um, your BA in political science? Uh, my honours was in international relations, and I was focusing, I mean, among other things, my, my key interest was in peace and conflict. So we did um, electives on conflict studies, mediation, um, international political economy. I mean, of course, IR theory, but then I was so glued onto uh, the peace and conflict um, as a field. And yeah. that's what then fed into my master's in political science. But I was really looking at the question of how do states uh, address the question of justice? when uh, institutions have failed to provide uh, security to its citizenry to the extent mm -hmm. that the state has become a, a, a machine of violence and an, an avenue through which uh, people do not um, enjoy their, their, their rights as enshrined in the constitution. So how do we restore back uh, what they call the rule of law? And mm. can the rule of law provide such um, an avenue for people to seek justice from a state sanctioned violence? So that became an area of interest, which I feel I continue to, to grapple with. Currently, of course, uh, we can get more into that, but it, it's, it's such, um, a personal almost journey for me in the sense of, um, you know, there, there's so much that has happened in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we can take it from different angles, but I think for me, the most uh, disappointing part um, 
when I look at the old generation and the sacrifices they made to give us uh, a better future as in the younger generation and you then find that okay the cycle of poverty we all think education can bring cannot be broken as, as, as easily as that because hey you know what in as much as our parents sent us to school and we got educated they themselves tried to get themselves educated um, the savings they thought they were keeping for themselves for retirement which would allow us to get a better starting in, in our careers you know are not there they are just not there. They were eroded by different uh, political changes that have happened in the country. And because of that, you find yourself continuously trapped in the cycle of poverty that it begs you the question, what is the role of state in providing us, you know, sustainable peace, which is not just the absence of violence, but you know, that satisfaction with our lives and knowing that we have guarantees in uh, the systems that are there. If, if we work, we're serving our pensions, we have guarantees that at a time when we need them, we can access them. So that's sort of like the trajectory that I've found myself in on a personal level. Yeah, so you, you've obviously been continuing with that in your PhD and obviously in your monograph as well. Um, so I suppose, you know, like the next question that would come from this is, um, you know, when I think about how I've, I've heard different academics talk about, you know, what you do in your master's and your PhD, a lot of people will say, you know, don't sort of do research on something that's too, I suppose, close to your heart. Um, and, and I suppose with our students, you see the danger of that sometimes, you know, where they're so in their topic, you can't tell them anything different, you know. Um, but I just want to sort of get your view on 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 that, um, because obviously there's also benefits to doing something that you really care about. So um, how do you think your your sort of personal interests and your research interests have, have um, I would say, like merged or, you know, intersected? OK. I guess if, if I'm to talk about this in a, from an angle of also reflecting about uh, the, the student community we have in the School of Governance is to really say, fortunately for me, um, I found myself doing this research. You know, it's not like a case of, oh, I'm working and I found this problem at work and I want to research it. That's not the kind of student that I was or have a researcher that I've become, but one who, you know, during my honors studies, there was a postdoc fellow in the um, uh, Department of Political Sciences at the University of Pretoria who was looking at mapping reconciliation processes in Africa and I was, you know, asked if I would love to join uh, in that uh, project. So I was recruited into a project. And um, so the starting point for me was not necessarily a personal interest in the subject, but rather an interest in understanding the research that was being done. Mm -hmm. So I started from a position of inquiry about knowledge and what it is that this project is all about and how do you research this question, uh, making use of uh, you know debates that that exist um, that help us to understand the phenomena of reconciliation or the phenomena of transitional justice, which are like the two key concepts that I've, I've grappled with in, in most of my research I've done, particularly at master's and PhD level, and also you see it in my monograph. So that's sort of like how I evolved um, as, as a scholar, uh, as a researcher, and as an academic. So joining a project helped me to distance myself from sort of like, uh, you know, uh, unqualified biases around issues that are there. When I say unqualified biases, you know how it is, which I always mention when I'm engaging with students that there is what we call street talk, you know, where people are just commenting about things, but they don't understand the intersecting systems and processes that create that phenomena. Mm -hmm. So for me, if one can move away from just uh, looking at things from face value and making a judgment about them and asking the question, what underlies this phenomenon? You would be onto something. So it doesn't matter whether it's something that's personal to you, you're seeing it in your workplace. Ask the question, what underlies this? Because from understanding what underlies this, you have, uh, you know, you would have figured an, 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 an inquiry that is academic that also contributes to the body of knowledge because uh, we understand uh, systems, processes, and the knowledges that informs uh, those processes. So 
I think for me, that's how it evolved. And it was only after I finished that project that I actually came up with the research question that I did for my master's. And then building on my master's project, um, you know, when you get examiners, uh, they give you feedback and areas for further research. So it was almost an easy, not that it's easy, it was almost an easy thing for me because I just took on the feedback from examiners to, you know, then make a follow up inquiry because uh, it was almost laid bare to me. So yeah. I think to summarize it, I'll say I joined the project. So maybe you could ask yourself, which other people are researching about this aspect and how do I join that community of scholars and see what they're talking about? Where is the, the conversation going? And what is my plug-in point? That's what I did. That's how I then developed my master's question, which was a plug-in point on something that could not be answered by the project, right? And I had to pick a case study, which was Zimbabwe. So it became easier for me to select my case because um, I had seen that the phenomena we were, we were looking at is present in Zimbabwe, the absence of justice, right? Where state sanctioned violence has occurred. So now the question I needed to answer was, how are people coping? What are their thoughts about this? And what does this justice mean? What should it entail? So I had to pick a, a particular period, which was um, uh, the Gukura Hunti genocide, which happened in the early 80s. And, and that one is a deeply politicized um, era and it's a deeply politicized encounter for which uh, on a political front, there are different explanations for why it happened. But I wanted to understand on the ground, the survivors, what is their account of what has happened and what would entail justice? So that was the gap I needed to fill. And in, in, in filling that gap, I was able to write about something on the subject matter, which is why I was able to even publish from my master's uh, thesis. So you should also be able to ask yourself, why am I doing research? Is it just so I get my qualification? Or I want to be able to answer a question which can help me to contribute to existing debates. So you should think about outputs from the project. So I'll, I'll, I'll put it uh, in that way. Okay, interesting. So, I mean, it sounds like you've obviously had like a, a very um, successful student journey. Um, but if you look back on it now, you know, is there anything that you feel like, you know, if I had just known this little one thing, you know, maybe I could have, you know, taken a different turn somewhere or, or done something a bit better? Um, or do you look back on it and say, you know, everything was as it should be, um, you know, I mean, that's how it is anyway, right? But yeah, maybe there's something. Of course, of course, uh, to be honest, I was just so scared of failing, so scared of failing. And the cost it meant for my parents and uh, my, my siblings who were sponsoring my education, such that I didn't have a life when I was in college. So I think, I, I, I don't know if it really answers you, but then in some ways that's, that's something I, I would say, um, if, if, if I had known uh, uh, that life is, is not that complex, it's, it's as easy as you make it be and as complex as you make it be, uh, I, I would have tried to change that. What do I mean? Like, for example, um, there are things I'm discovering now that I enjoy, like how we're talking now on this platform, you know, and in college, we, we had a tax FM, I never auditioned for it. And <laughs> I mean, imagine the kind of voice I would and, or contributions I would have had uh, through my studies. You know, it would have been a, a platform for me to already begin to engage and debate about the different issues uh, we, we're seeing in life. Because hang on, now as an academic, to some extent, I'm expected to contribute to the community. But I often find myself shying away, you know, you feel like, uh, am I good enough? Am I doing it right? Because I never had the exposure. And I was so scared to venture into other things because I thought it would detract me from, from my studies and I would fail. So I should have tried, uh, you know, 
being on radio when I was still in college. Um, and uh, other things I think I could have tried, um, you know how when you're selecting your modules, and I think this is particularly, ad I'm addressing this particularly to students who are starting their degrees or students who are in metric or going to be completing metric um, and thinking of going into college. Do not look at your degree. Like I, I just picked the modules that seemed very relevant to my degree. You know, when they tell you, they give you that column, I did not go out as much as possible to pick electives from the other fields, which would have helped me to really blossom, right? Because mm. you will find that if you narrow down your qualification too soon, you will uh, lose out on other opportunities. So it's not that you do like I did political science and then you're going to be an academic or whatsoever. Your career is shaped by the exposures you've given yourself to in the modules that you learned when you're still in college. So probably I should have picked journalism at some point. Of course, I did French, but I didn't have a community to practice it with. So it's almost gone now. <laughs> if I can yeah. get more people to talk to about it, then probably the vocabulary is going to come back to me. So I could have uh, picked uh, some of those things um, because, I mean, even low modules, it would help me a lot in what I'm doing currently but of course you can always make up by reading or some of those things but it's not the same as being in a class where you get to interact and learn uh, from peers who are learning about the same uh, concept or phenomena at that time so I think on a personal level those are things that I think if I could go back and change I would have yeah. tried to change and better have a life when you're in college but of course there are downsides to it you need to balance it I guess um, in terms of um, the more uh, serious things about the journey that I've walked to where I am now, to be frank, this journey chose me. I, I was not so conscious about the next step, the next step, the next step. It was a survival. Like I said, I came to do my, my bachelor's and then the next thing you realize okay, you can necessarily work here and home is not an option. So to remain here, I have to continue studying. And I think uh, different um, people who have immigrated um, understand that for you to fit into a system, sometimes you, you have to advance yourself beyond a point where they can't say no to you staying. So yeah. that's how I, 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 I went on from my bachelor's to my honors. And when I was doing my master's, I realized, oh, immigration policies have changed, uh, particularly for my kind of qualification. You actually need a PhD to qualify for, you know, for residence and being able to be a critical skills person in the country. So that's sort of like how that journey chose me. And of course, when you finish, um, you then realize you have to survive. So I, if I could change some of the things uh, that have um, that I have walked through uh, in 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 all this, I I think um, it's probably diversifying my 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 degree program. I know uh, there is a, a link between uh, political science and and faculty of law, especially at UP, where you can have your undergrad or honors in, in, in IR or politics, and then you do their MPhil in um, human rights or something like that. So maybe, maybe that's one thing <laughs> I may change, but I'm happy with where I am. So let's say it is fair. Yeah. Yeah, I find that interesting because your work does sort of draw on different disciplines, right? So even the concept of justice that comes from law, um, and then of course you touch on politics. So um, I suppose there, there are many ways to skin a cat, right? So just because you don't have a law degree doesn't mean you can't, um, you know, sort of do research that touches on that. But yeah, um, it's interesting how you, how, you know, you ended up coming to, to where you are. Um, and now that you describe your your work the way you do it, it actually is very relevant to international relations funny enough because usually yeah. when we think about international relations we talk about um you know the, the relationships between states and you know diplomats and this and that so I suppose it's also um that's also part of 
um, decolonizing the curriculum, if you want to call it that, or transforming it, right, is, is shifting the bounds of inquiry, I suppose. Um, but just and, like you know, if I could say something, sorry, uh, funny enough, you know, I, I think I'd almost forgotten about this. When we were second year, we did um, the U, um, it's called, uh, it's a UN module. It's sort of like where you do the model United Nations. You oh, mean, yes, what model happens UN, there, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And I tell you, after that, um, and one of the lecturers was like, uh, how many of you would love to get into the diplomatic community? I tell you, everyone, they mm. put their hands up because I think that's sort of like the career for anyone yeah. who's done sciences you almost think that we all should become diplomats or serve in the diplomatic community i mean we know there are different organizations that um, fall under that you know uh, you thinking of your un and its different organs and also you can be a diplomat uh, being uh, um, sent out by your state right but he did a diagram for us where he laid out how long it takes you oh to <laughs> progress yeah. right and we're all like, huh? So what do we become? You know, it yeah. was almost like, what do we become? Like, what do we become? So I think that's why I say this career chose me because from that second day, I knew, uh, I, of course, at some point, maybe I could still end up being a diplomat or being in the diplomatic um, uh, community, but um, I need to be working on something that takes me there. I need to be grappling with an issue that takes me there. So that's sort of like how um, this question of justice became important because believe it or not, um, you know, in as much as uh, the question of justice has been asked by uh, the people in the legal fraternity, it's actually a political question. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the failure of state to account for injustices, it's a political question. And we, we cannot uh, leave it uh, to the courts or to the legal fraternity to answer that question. So we need to answer the question around what are the political issues that are uh, creating the situation where institutions we've put in place are not working for us. Because at the end of the day, when we're thinking about political science, it's about rules of engagement that govern us. Who creates those rules? It's us. Us. and we create them through politicking right and we end up uh, enshrining them in our bill of rights uh, we then create our policies and things like that to function for us right and when they're not functioning we need to go back to the drawing board to the politicking aspect of it so that everything else functions so I, I feel much of what exists in our society today is a political question even if we want to look at uh, the rollout of the vaccine, it's a political question. Mm -hmm. If, and, and I just think that when we take, um, you know, the question of politics outside of just looking at government and trying to understand how the different uh, political decisions that are made impact us at a personal level, we'll begin to understand that it is such a powerful uh, field of study that, mm -hmm everyone should be interested in and be able to contribute, uh, be it through engineering, whatever field you end up, you know, or space you end up working in, you need to understand the political uh, question, which is important. Mm. I suppose that's, um, you know, we, you know, the broader study of governance comes in, right? Because it's saying we're not just looking at the government, you know, we're looking at every, all the role players in our society. Um, and I think, you know, that's the value of, um, multidisciplinary schools right is that you know you can sort of have that sort of broad spectrum or a larger view of an issue um which which, which is also quite valuable yeah so i just want to um then ask you about um your journey then as a supervisor so um you know you obviously started on the one side of the equation as a student um and now you are a supervisor um is there anything that you feel you know, now as a supervisor that you, you wish you could tell students that you maybe couldn't or something that you are always finding, you know, you have to repeat to your students because it's like, um, you know, students just don't know this because they're students, but now that I'm a supervisor, I can see, okay, there's a gap there. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think the, the, the big thing that students need to understand is the shift. 
there is a shift in, 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 in every level of study that one embarks on. And you actually need to look at it from that point to be, or, to be able to um, you know, adjust and adapt your inquiry, your approach to, to, to tackling your, your, your studies. And when I say the shift, I'm just thinking when I look back to undergrad, we had a study guide that you know, we were given. And um, in some instances, the lecturers would even give us the readings, right? So all I needed to do was read, and then I'd look in the study guide and look at what are the learning outcomes. So as long as I can tick the box around the learning outcomes, cool, I would pass my, 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 my course, right? And sometimes we always ask the lecturer, please give us the scope, me. What's the scope for, 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 for this for course, right? Yeah. For the test. And, yeah. and you would get uh, the, the, the scope and you would find that when we were given assignments to do, we were answering a question. We never asked the question. You know, of course, maybe in class when uh, 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 the lecturer is facilitating, that's when you would raise, I don't understand this. Could you please explain this? Uh, do you understand? Uh, so does it relate to, you know, what do you think about this situation, right? And uh, that, those are the only times I think in a way people as, a, as, a, as an undergrad student, when I look back at my life, right? Um, how I engaged with the academy. That's sort of like how I engaged. I had, I was distant. Right. Mm -hmm. It was there and I'm here. Um, and what I was interested in is passing my, my modules. Uh, it's like a passive right. engagement. Um, the, the work is there and I'm just the absorbing. Work. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So it was a passive engagement. Exactly. But uh, when, when we were looking at uh, master's and PhD, to be honest, it's a huge shift. You cannot be passive. Mm -hmm. You actually have to be active. And your active engagement is not one way you are asking the lecturer questions or your supervisor questions. I'm not saying you shouldn't ask, but actually you should be engaging from a point of, I've been reading about this, 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 and that, and this is what I'm taking for it, from it, mm -hmm. right? And not just be somebody who, who reads, like I, I, I cringe when a student says, so I'm just using the, um, What's that? The change, uh, the the change theory. What's that? Systems, systems uh, uh, theory. I cringe, right? <laughs> from the from the point that you have not explored mm. possible ways to answer the question that you want, or even there is no question yet mm. that you want to answer in your project, and it's your duty to create that question. And to create it, you need to have read literature and see the gap in terms of how are people, you know, engaging with the subject matter, and what point of entry do I want to 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 get on from, right? Such that you can already map out. This is what has been discussed about the subject matter, and I'm contributing to this uh, aspect of it by answering this question especially in my context, because there is this gap in my context, right? So that becomes important and interesting to a lecturer because, or to your supervisor rather, because they can see you have mapped out where you wanna go, right? And their role is really to mentor you. I usually love to use the analogy of, um, you know, um, in a, at, at the airport, you have the flight controllers and you have the pilot. The student is the pilot. Mm. The supervisor is the air controller. They're on the ground, right? Mm. And the, 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 the air controller, we actually have two, two of them. They're those who are on the ground and there's the guy who's on the deck yeah. who can see, right? And the guy on the deck can see and almost understands the whole map, right? In terms of the networks that are there in the, in, the, in the sky where you want to take off and all this. But then there are other people who are also involved who bring in weather information, right? So there are multiple parts to what makes an aeroplane fly, mm. but you're on the pilot seat. Mm. 
you need to understand how the different parts work and the role they will be playing in your journey. And if you can understand that, you will know that at the end of the day, the person who reverses the flight is not the, the flight controller on the ground who's doing this. This guy is just checking to tell you all clear, all <laughs> yeah. clear. You can go all clear, right? And the guy who's on the deck is also there to tell you all clear, right? The passage is opened. You can take off, right? Yeah. Clear for check off, right? And if you check when pilots are, 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 are flying, right? They, they need clearance at each stage, right? Mm -hmm. And if you understand that, you would then know that's the role your supervisor will be playing. You should be a qualified person. Mm. You Can don't not... fly a plane yeah. without having spent the hours to get mm. your certificate as a pilot. Mm. Right. So in a sense, if you are doing your master's, if you're working on your PhD, you are actually in that training process where you are doing the hours so that you become a pilot. Mm. Now, if someone is not doing their hours, how do you get the, the certification? Yeah. Absolutely. So if one can understand that, it becomes easier to know that, okay, there's a role that the traffic controller on the deck plays and the guy who's on the ground who has like the thingy, there's a role that they play, right? And there's always a first pilot and, um, you know, there's the captain and all those <laughs> and the co-pilot and stuff, right? Um, I, I put the supervisor as, as, a, as a traffic controller um, partly because um, they're not going to be sitting in the plane. They're outside the plane, right? But some would, uh, would keep, because I, I think I'd make the student the captain and there's the, 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 there's the, the co-pilot, right? Um, the first officer and things like that. But if one can understand that both of you are working towards the safe travel, of this jet, you will then understand when uh, you're told to hold, you know, you put on hold or you're told to circle back, mm. right? It's, it's, it's because they're all trying to give you a safe landing. They're also maybe trying to, to give you a safe takeoff because they say the takeoff and landing are mm. critical. Most dangerous parts, yeah. They're the <laughs> most dangerous parts. So mm. at your proposal development phase, you need to understand if you put on hold and there are things that need to be checked on, check on them. Mm. Until you're told clear for, take off. Mm. You then take off. Mm. You will understand that your flight will cruise much better. Even you will see, they'll tell you go to 5,000, right? or whatever, you know, they'll <laughs> yeah. tell you at what cruising altitude you should be at. So they, 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 they remain at that guiding level mm. to navigate you to your destination. Mm. And before you land, there are things that pilots have to tick off and ensure they are in check such that they can land. Even mm. after they land, they have to wait, right, until they're cleared so that they open the door. Yeah. And then passengers can get out. Sure. So if we can understand some of these things, you know, from this analogy, you will see that the university, when it gives you a, a, a placement, they are trusting that you have interest and there's something you want to work on. But you will be somebody who will put time to it so that you qualify, right? But beyond that, you will also make the interest to understand the processes, the rules, the policies. Sometimes I find it challenging when students want to skip the processes, when they want, suddenly they want to rush up their time, right? If you don't work on a set plan, which is the other critical thing for pilots, they always have a plan for their journey. They don't just take off, they plan the route they're going to take and they will understand the weather in the different parts, the regions that they cross as they are cruising, right? And they will even plan their landing approach. 
because they would have been told how the landing, uh, their, their, their destination, how the airport looks like, right? Mm. So you will find that as a student, there's a manual in a, in a way on postgraduate studies. Make time to read it. Understand the time frame you're working in such that even if you have work commitments, family commitments, and any other commitments, you still understand that you're joining into a commitment mm. with the supervisor, with the university. And time is of essence. So if anything is happened, make a mayday, 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 mayday. We have an emergency, <laughs> right? Yeah. You should be able to make a mayday so that you alert people not to disappear, and mm. then suddenly you reappear when you realize maybe <laughs> the university has sent you that letter to say, if you don't submit by this date, you're out. Mm. Yeah. So for me, that's sort of like one of the key things uh, I would want students to understand as a supervisor. But of course, there are other aspects we can always talk about. This yeah. sounds negative, but I, I think <laughs> that's how we, we can deal with it because it's always a problem. Yeah, it's, it's a lovely analogy. I really like it. Um, and I suppose I think there's also like, and maybe it's also the way, you know, the traditional academic is, you know, very aloof, um, you know, this person that you don't know anything about their lives. Um, but it's also useful for people to know, you know, that supervisors are people. So, you know, we also have families, we also have things that happen in our lives. So if you come and you say, you know, I'm sick, or I've had a death in the family or whatever, there are, there are rules in the university's manual that allow for those things. So it's not that, you know, you're speaking to some robot, you know, who, who doesn't understand, you know, that people have lives, people have lives. So these things happen. So yeah, absolutely agree with you. Um, you know, they're not like disappearing and reappearing, you know, in November and then you need to submit in February. <laughs> yeah, that's- And you've it. planned your December for other things, hey? Yes, yes, absolutely. So yeah. Definitely yeah. agree with you on that one. So yeah, I really like that analogy. I might use it. I might steal it from you. <laughs> so um, I just want to like circle back to you, um, you your journey as a, a student again, um, you know, and particularly as a student from another country, um, you know, and if you could sort of tell us, you know, what are some of your experiences you had in terms of um, funding? So you said that your, um, you know, your family members were play, paying proverbial black tax. Um, I hope you I hope you paid back your taxes. Um, you know, your, your family was funding your study. I know that, you know, it's very really expensive for foreign students um, to study. Um, they often have to pay, you know, large deposits up front, you know, that sort of thing, you know, stuff that, you know, students who live in a particular country don't have to pay. I mean, it's even worse if you go like to Europe or, or North America, right? Um, it can be like really expensive. In terms of your funding, um, is that something you've, you know, that was sort of like a stressor for you or is that something that's always been taken care of or did you end up applying for like grants and stuff later on um, in your studies? Uh, so um, I would say, um, sorry, for my undergraduate uh, studies, um, much of it uh, was funded by my parents and my, my elder brother uh, who, who was working uh, at, at that time. I mean, like I, like I mentioned, I don't know if I said that we, we like uh, four siblings, of course we were five, one is late. And uh, so my elder brother was the one who first moved here and then he had been working, he took over my sister and then my other brother and I'm the <laughs> last one. So by the time yeah. I moved, I had three elder siblings who were in a way, um, somehow economically active uh, and then my parents um, being uh, civil servants um, we also in some ways um, uh, you know finding ways to 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 raise funds I, I would say um, they they had I mean in, in Zim uh, people have they do the side hustle so mm -hmm. My parents had to do the side hustle to, to yeah, pay yeah. For, for my studies, right? Uh, of course, so it was a, a collective in terms of uh, my parents and my siblings, uh, you know, making it um, 
or work uh, to, 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 to pay for, for, for my studies. And I think I'm deeply grateful for, for my brother and my sister-in-law, my brother's wife. You know, it's, it's not everyone who, who, I mean, they're just starting their marriage and then they have this yeah. uh, black text thing to, to take <laughs> care of. And um, they, they committed to it and um, they managed to, to, to pay for my tuition. And I was also fortunate. I, I met uh, one of the, this lady, her name is Teresa Walls, um, at uh, a church that my brother used to go to. She, she, she was fond of me and then said, you know what, I just feel drawn to supporting your studies. So she oh. also was contributing uh, to my studies. So I was raised by a community of, of people who contributed in different ways, um, you know, paying for my tuition, paying for res, uh, paying for my books, and, you know, my, my living expenses, food, and, 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 and all those things. So it, it, it became uh, like that. And I, I was fortunate that uh, when I was in my third year, um, I was recruited as a teaching assistant, as a tutor. So in a way, uh, I now managed to have a little bit of money to, yeah. to pay for some of, uh, you know, where you, you become financially responsible. So there's some mm. things I, I, I would say, this is, is, is my baby, I'll take care of, of, of these things. And so um, even uh, in my honors, I was still uh, doing uh, the teaching assistancy into my master's, I started lecturing. And then uh, at my PhD, I was now also lecturing. So that sort of like uh, helped me in some way to, to cushion uh, the financial aspect of, of, of things. So there are some of those opportunities uh, available. I'm not so sure how the, the, the terrain is currently, um, but uh, in my time, it was, it was, it was there. But I think uh, particularly for, for my PhD studies, um, I became intentional in applying for, for funding, um, partly because uh, the project I was working on uh, when, I, when I started at my master's level, um, you know, my supervisor was very much interested in it. So she then applied for a big grant with uh, Condestria. So I became plugged onto, uh, onto that, which helped me to cover some of my research exp uh, expenses. So I would always think that, from a strategic point, one needs to plan, not just planning that I'm going to go to this university and study. Mm -hmm. Try to plan for your financial aspect of the studies as well, because it yeah. can affect your progression, right? Mm -hmm. And you need to be very savvy with money, you know, like um, almost like frivolous. Don't, don't be somebody that if you get the opportunity to have a bit of money, you, I don't know, People make different choices when it comes to money. But for me, it was very important that I pay for my, for my accommodation. And I, I live in the least expensive um, accommodation. Decent, but not too expensive. So I had to share uh, in a flat uh, where, where, where I was staying. And then I, I, I didn't need a car then. It, it was a liability. But I know um, sometimes mm -hmm. people can end up uh, picking some of those things. So when I had the, the funding that I had, it was now enough for me to plan for my um, accommodation for me to plan for my field work, because when I was doing my master's, it was really difficult to do field work. I was not funded. And with the PhD, I, I could not have survived if I didn't have funding. So I, I had part, partial funding from the project that my supervisor was de doing on the Codestria project. And then I applied for the Social Science uh, Research Council's Next Gen uh, program, which I was fortunate in, enough to get it three times. So, oh. uh, so that helped me to cover all my expenses in terms of research expenses for mm -hmm. the project that I was doing, which I'm happy for, uh, you know, because I was able to have the liberty to do what I wanted to do in my project. And um, there was also the um, NIHSS, which um, uh, at the time was funding, it was called the pa African Pathways, which uh, funded, um, you know, um, which funded uh, doctoral students from, from African countries within, within South Africa. So I had to look for those funding opportunities, but for specific things. So uh, SSRC did cover the expense for my research, right? And um, 
the NIHS has covered uh, my living expenses uh, here in South Africa. And um, I would be happy at some point on your platform to come back and engage on how do we hunt? Because it's a hunt, hey? You actually have yeah. to be prepared to go for a hunt in this yeah. jungle, right? How do we hunt for funding? How do you, you know, prepare the best um, possible uh, application for, for funding? Because I was fortunate enough to, to have uh, those um, grants, which helped me to cover all the, the expenses. But importantly, importantly, I was plugged into a community of mm -hmm. scholars networking, I cannot stress this enough. At master's and PhD level, you need to be networking. Mm. You cannot crack the code of your project if you're not part of a network where people are constantly talking about it. Mm. You know, where people are asking you, did you say this is what you are doing? And you have to explain yourself again, right? And you'll find yeah. that the more you talk about your project, the clearer the aspect you're working on becomes. I tell you, the first uh, workshop I attended for next gen, there are words I was using. I, 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 I mean, in terms I was using in my project that was so problematic. And I didn't <laughs> know. And yeah. I didn't know innocently using them, right? And at first you try to be defensive, but, but this is what I'm trying to say. And you have other people say, but, but you know what? This is what it means. This is what it means. It's mm. very loaded. What you're trying to do is this simple. So why don't you just choose this and, and work on these terms? And I tell you, by the time I was in my third year of the PhD, which fortunately I finished on record time, by the time I was in my third year, uh, being part of these networks, I kind of yeah. had developed the lingo because you, you definitely have to develop the lingo. And I think when we think of postgraduate studies, you are maturing. Right. That's why I said the shift. Yeah. Are maturing. And in maturing, you have to understand the vocabulary of that context, but also create mm -hmm. your own vocabulary to explain the subject matter that you are dealing with. Sure. Wow. So yeah, definitely fortunate with funding, but also proactive, right? Um, and yeah, I suppose it, it can also be a bit of a minefield, right? Because you'll find that, you know, sometimes, um, you know, certain things will only be um, allocated for citizens or certain groups of citizens, or because you have a certain type of job, you don't qualify for that, or it's only people who have this type of job who qualify for this. So I can imagine that it can be a minefield. I think it'll definitely be useful to have a, a follow-up conversation on that. Um, yeah. But then just, um, I want to also ask you about, so you had your little funding journey coming in, which is not little, it's a lot. People obviously made a lot of sacrifices there. Um, but in terms of your sort of, you know, like the cultural shift, if there was any cultural shift, you know, from, um, you know, your secondary schooling in Zimbabwe to coming to South Africa as a first year student, um, but also in terms of like, you know, your emotional support, I suppose you were also fortunate that you did have your family uh, um, already. Um, I, would, I would imagine that there are a lot of students who make this move and then they are very like isolated um, and I mean, we are people, right? We can't pretend that that's not an important part of who we are and it would affect your studies. Um, so how did you sort of deal with um, those two things, you know, sort of making making the, the move this, this side? So uh, like you're saying, uh, luckily I had uh, my some of my siblings already here, but um, on a technicality, <laughs> I stayed alone uh, for, 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 my, for my undergrad in the sense that I was placed in res. And it took me ah. back to my high school days where I was in boarding school. So I went to a missionary oh, okay, school. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. I think mentally I was prepared to this idea of being on my own because mm -hmm. um, I went to a boarding school. I mean, there are politics around boarding schools and all those <laughs> things, but I think it did me well in terms of independence. Mm. So I was independent, right? So I think my first detachment was when I was moving from primary school to secondary school. And I remember my sister always makes a joke about this and even her, her friends um, who were in the same high school, you know, when, when they looking at me, they're saying, oh, that baby, you know, grown up, you know, you used to be such a clingy baby, you know, so <laughs> just a side joke in my high school. So when I moved to, to, to high school, my sister went to the same high school and I was from one when she was 
form six. Mm. And I was so homesick. Oh. You know, I would always and- go to, to so, you know, the way we stayed uh, in, in, in high school, like the boarding uh, places, the dormitories, they were um, differentiated, like for those in A-levels, uh, yeah. you know, the juniors and things like that. So there was a barrier which, you know, you couldn't necessarily just access your sister when she's yeah. in her dormitory. Oh. So I would always, like almost every other time, literally every day <laughs> especially <laughs> the first few days yeah i'd always be outside and calling oh, yeah Mary, Mary. Oh. you know like i would call my <laughs> sisters <laughs> shame man so almost almost all her friends will always be like Mary, your sister's outside and, and it became so it's always a joke that we had that so for me that was the the, the initial phase of my separation and and growing mm. but i mean after six years in boarding school i i was sharp i was, yeah. I was good and, and ready for the street i became streetwise yeah. so when i moved uh, to south africa i and then was placed in in residence i, I kind of uh, understood that uh, you know this is survival i i have to to fit yeah. in i have to build a community of of, of friends uh, within this new space but the biggest shift for me in terms of cultural difference um at the time up was still very much africans in terms of the residences um of course now things have have changed we would sing some songs in africans <laughs> we would had to do different uh you know res activities but yeah. the language was deeply africans so not that i have any issue with with the language but mm. i didn't know why we were doing it mm. so it was more like why do i have to be doing all these things and mm. uh, I, I think the 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 underlying thing was to get us involved to be active yeah. maybe creating the space to but it didn't feel like that, especially because the language was not inclusive. Mm. So I really felt like an outsider. And even when we went for socials at the boys' res, ooh, we were only a handful <laughs> of black students mm. in res. So even when we went for those socials, most of the guys were not of my skin color so <laughs> yeah. to interact i mean there's 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 the issue of our nationality being different there's the issue mm. of the language being different but then there's also the question of race mm. and it 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 was always the case that we would be on our own corner as as black girls and here when i say black girls i'm also including south africans who 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 were in in, in res i think in terms of international students um who were in res who were not that many so there were also yeah. a couple of uh, black south africans in 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 in, in res but I can tell you, I really felt excluded in terms of those activities that were there. So the, 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 the resort to is not to attend. So mm. that's also some of the things I missed out. I, I, I felt I didn't need to attend uh, because you, you would not necessarily enjoy. It was not inclusive. So mm. that was like the, 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 the big uh, uh, cultural shift where we, we, they're creating a platform, but the platform does not speak to, to who I am. What do I love? I love praying my djembe. You know, I love uh, cultural activities. So I ended up gravitating towards activities that were outside the race, like um, attending uh, Ovoa, when it, uh, which is a cultural ensemble at, at UP. So whenever it performed, I, I attended uh, the their, their their events and activities because that resonated uh, with me a, a lot more and uh, any such events when they were happening festivities and things like that that became my go-to in terms of uh, enjoying but other than uh, the the res culture the res life uh, in terms of the institution itself um, I, I, I think I was quick enough to find a body of international students. Mm. So we then had almost like a clique, right? Where I, I would just tap into that. If, if, if I felt so homesick, I would just plug into that. So that, that sort of like uh, really helped me. But um, 
I, I think they, there's definitely more need to create spaces for inclusivity mm -hmm. um, where we embrace um, our diversity, you know, be it uh, the local diversity that is the South Africa is really a rich country and I've spent more time um, like uh, traveling across South Africa just to embrace its beauty, right? And, and I love that about South Africa, uh, but also, you know, making such effort to embrace that diversity and the beauty that comes with diversity would really make uh, everyone's experience within an academic setting phenomenal. Yeah, sure. Wow, what a journey. Um, I mean, I went to an Afrikaans school, so, um, you know, I sort of have an idea of, you know, how those traditions work, you know, and, you know, how the Afrikaans community works, you know, like they really sort of try and, um, like they're really traditional people, you know, so they try and like hold on to, to those little things, but it can be, um, it can end up being exclusive, you know, especially in a setting like university where you now have people from literally all over the world, you know, sort of coming together. But I think, yes, those things have changed um, over time. I know at UJ, they've even renamed the Rezas. A lot of them had Afrikaans names. So, you know, I suppose, you know, it's little things, but, you know, the symbolisms, um, they, they mean a lot um, for, for that sort of, you know, being more inclusive, I suppose. Yeah. The last thing I want to ask you about, and the most excited, um, yes. It's about your, your, your creative writing, right? So I think a lot of students, and I know this is it for me as well, um, and research scholars, you know, we sort of think about research, you know, as like this formal activity that you undertake, you know, and you sit at your computer and you sort of type away, um, you know, and you write in your formal language. But what I've also come to learn now um, is that, you know, you just, you can't do that. There's also... Um, and I suppose like our one colleague, Dr. Darlene Miller, you know, she's sort of really good at doing this, you know, saying, you know, if you're a researcher, you don't just research on your computer. If you're a social sciences scholar, you sort of do your research all over, you know, you go to plays and you look at how people interact and you do this, that and the other. Um, and I suppose I like how you've done this also in your creative writing where you sort of found a different outlet um, for your work other than the sort of formal traditional outlets. Um, so you, can you tell us a bit more about that, um, you know, how, where you sort of write and how you feel like it's, how you feel it impacts your more formal work as a researcher? As a researcher. Uh, thanks for that question. I, I, I guess for me, um, you know, grappling to fit in the lingo, of, you know, journals and, um, you know, some of these traditional outlets for, for publications. Um, and having done my um, secondary education in, in Zim, where one of the key uh, subjects I did was uh, Shona literature, right? So uh, that kind of came back post, especially at, at my master's and PhD level, where I, I was dealing with people's stories. These are narratives that are explaining political situations in, in, in Zimbabwe. And you can't just box them or package them as, as you know, this technical in this technical language. But you you need to uh, uplift the authenticity of those experiences. And uh, that's what took me back to um, you know, literature and how we, we, we wrote uh, when we were doing uh, literature, when I was doing Shona literature. And because my research, I, I do it in, in my mother tongue. And uh, most of the people that I engage with, uh, in some instances, I, I work with interpreters for the different dialects that I'm not necessarily, um, you know, very conversant in or the other languages that I'm not conversant in. I mean, Zimbabwe is a very uh, diversely cultural society. Um, so, because of that and how one word can get you th through a journey where you can understand deeply how a person has felt, how uh, you know, through time they, they have processed the encounter. I, I felt I would be lying to my 
community if I don't present it in their language. And that then took me through a, press, a, a, a process where I learned to express um, and, and narrate uh, stories and then give an analytical angle to it. And um, you find that uh, some of the outlets that really allow for such expressions, um, I've, I've, I've put my work in uh, Africa as a country, um, I've put it on Kujenga Amani. And also fortunately, uh, when I, my, my, my monograph with, with, with Palgrave, you know, they, they allowed me to harness um, those um, local expressions and develop meaning out of it, which then becomes the, I think, almost like the process of decolonizing what we write about and bringing back the human element to uh, the work uh, that we do and understanding that society is made up of human beings that have feelings, that have expressions and ways of understanding what has happened to them, what is happening to them. And they also have ways of informing how they want the society to be. So that then became um, you know, an angle for me and the lens through which I, I, I want my work uh, to, to, to connect uh, with society through, uh, as and um, that's how I sort of like define my meaning and contribution to society and um, you know you cannot speak about humanity if you cannot express their language and if you cannot bring their language to your writing and that has become um, a way for me to to, to create um, um, the, the scholarship that, that I write about. And um, I find it uh, much more meaningful because uh, through my travel, for example, at one point I went to Colombia and I visited the indigenous communities. I tell you, I was able to connect with the activities we were doing because I had experienced them in my own research. And I was now able to draw from uh, you know, the expressions they gave about the, 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 the encounters we were having to the experience and encounters that people that I work with in my community um, you know, have gone through. And from there, one is then able to bring in different voices and show that as humanities in different contexts, we have different ways of expressing ourselves and different ways of being. And if we're able to embrace that in scholarship, I think it becomes more impactful. So that's in a way um, how I have brought in the, you know, the diverse ways of writing about uh, the encounters that I, I experience in, in my research, partly because for me, it's also a way of documenting my community, which is underrepresented. And at some times, um, the way people express things is from a different you know, lens. They're not necessarily embedded to understand uh, the humanity, the spirituality of things and the interconnectedness of the community and how this in a way shapes uh, you know, the different encounters that, uh, that people have. So I've sort of like, it's a difficult process to really get to, but I've found that when I write in non-technical ways um, and when I make uh, the expressions of, uh, the, you know, the, the communities that I engage with, the foundation of uh, my scholarship and uh, I bring out their voice, um, it, it becomes... Um, much more uh, meaningful to the to the work that I do. Oh, powerful. I mean, it's a really different way of thinking about, you know, the traditional, um, you know, you sort of do your interviews, you know, and you find your your themes and that's, <laughs> that's the end of the story. Um, but yeah, I think that also definitely sort of centers, um, you know, what we would call the research subjects. I know some people don't like to like to call it that, um, but often they sort of like, you know, in the background, I think that sort of brings them, you know, brings their stories to the fore. But yeah, really powerful. Wow. <laughs> yeah, just so interesting talking to you. I had such a good time. Um, you know, some of the interest, uh, some of the insights you shared was so valuable. Um, I think, you know, as a student and a, a supervisor myself, I learned so much. Um, and yeah, um, I think we'll definitely get you back on that funding story. <laughs> 
Um, because that's, you know, like you don't just need funding as a student, as an academic, it's also important, um, you know, to, it speaks to the feasibility of a lot of what we do, right? Um, Definitely. So yeah, thank you so much for your time, Ruth. I really, I really appreciate it. And yes, we'll see you on next time. Thank you, Odu. <laughs> Happy to be here. And yeah, I enjoyed. Always a pleasure. <laughs> All right. <laughs>